to Life Hacker for April 2nd. I am Adam Pash here with Adam Duchess and Whitson Gordon. That's true. We're going to be talking about stuff today. So, <laughs> what kind of stuff? stuff? Let's kick it off with some <laughs> news. Okay, so starting things off, Ohm Malik from Giga Ohm, uh, the eponymous Giga Ohm. Uh, has announced or uh, had a post Discovered. earlier this week basically saying that he has very reliable sources that tell him that Google Drive, which is basically at least thought to be something like Dropbox from Google, Google uh, is coming in the first week of April. And uh, details were relatively sparse, um, but if from the sense of things, it looks like uh, a rumor we previously heard about it. There was a screenshot of something that looked like it. It's sort of a, the web interface looks something like Google Docs, if this is truly what it is. Uh, and it will have a desktop component, presumably someone like Dropbox. And it, according to the rumor at least, will start out for one gigabyte free. So what do you guys think? Google Drive. I, well, I feel it sounds like it's it's basically Google taking what InSync does. I mean, it's t they're taking what Dropbox does, but InSync is literally storing um, is storing all their their synced files in Google Docs and syncs all your files in Google Docs to the desktop. So that's it's like it's already it already exists, um, and you get that one gigabyte free, and you just pay Google for storage. So do you think um, though that kind of bad for them for one thing? <laughs> Do you right. think that it's anything, like, is there anything anyone's going to be excited about? Because that's not, no one's, I'm not using well, that now because I don't really care that much. I don't want yeah. that. Yeah, well, I mean, everyone's already on Dropbox. Yeah, I could be less it's, excited. It's kind of, there, there's not, I mean, aside from the fact that it will probably be cheaper and some people might like it because it yeah. syncs their Google Docs. I mean, it, but there's just, there's so much more that Dropbox does at this point, feature-wise, that... That's a good point about price, though. Like, if, if they do come out with, like, a... Like you can pay to get more storage. If it's anything like yeah. what you can pay to get more storage from a Google, your Google, Google yeah. yeah, then then those prices are really great, better than Dropbox. Oh but, yeah, they're way but better. But if you're going for free, yeah. you can. We, we, we've talked about this countless times. Yeah. I have like 20 free gigs of space on Dropbox, yeah. and that is not. I'm not about to go down to one gig just for maybe what Gmail integration. What's right. that going to offer that Dropbox mm -hmm. doesn't already have? Um, yeah, it's really if you wanted to pay. Google's also in the situation where um, all of the post Dropbox competitors are, which is that Dropbox was was the first to to really like nail it mm -hmm. with that sort of seamless sync and uh, Spider Oak, Sugar Sync. Like there are these other services that have come out, and, and a lot of them are offering like really more features deals. yeah and good deals and whatnot. But but Dropbox is it's simple, it's set, set it and forget it, and it's a service that. You're like you're in. Yeah. And once you're in it, it's it's. It there's no like, so well. there's no purely <coughs> compelling reason to, to ditch it for something else when it works very well. Mm -hmm. um, you can get a lot for free, and um, and in my case, I'm happy to pay for it because it works so well. Yeah, and I have to say it has a lot to do with the desktop software for me with Dropbox because I used to use SugarSync mm -hmm. and I loved SugarSync initially, but I had a bunch of problems with it. I mean, like iTunes was uh, it didn't sync iTunes and nothing syncs iTunes very well, but. Um, but SugarSync had a whole bunch of problems with it, and um, and some of the other stuff, and it didn't. I felt like it. it this may have changed, but it didn't deal with um, uh, file conflicts very well. Yeah. So, Dropbox, but it, it also was like if the, the software was initially, it's kind of like felt like it was built in Java or something. Yeah. And Dropbox really feels like a native. Yeah, definitely. Application. And Google, in the Google, the big challenge at this point basically mm -hmm. is um, one making it better in any way. It's the same thing. I, I did a post uh, a month or two ago that was about Google's, Google is AOL, is Facebook, whatever. Yeah. And it was basically talking about right now Google's in a situation where they're not really building new and innovative products so much anymore as they are um, either acquiring good products or copying existing products. So Google Plus, for example, um, copy whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's got some original things about it, but Google Plus, n no one at Google like I said in the post, like woke up from a dream and was like, I have the greatest idea, yeah. Google Plus. <laughs> really, Google was like, we need uh, something competitive mm -hmm. in this space. We need to be able to collect this data that's out there that no one else is giving us, that Facebook isn't giving mm -hmm. us and Twitter isn't giving us. And so I feel like this is like trying, and you know, it's just it's just getting trying to get more buy into the Google ecosystem, yeah. which is understandable, but it's not going to... Unless they're doing something original, it's hard to be compelling for th us to use. I think there's a big difference. And, like, so obviously there are problems with Google just acquiring a bunch of people. The quality yeah. of their products just 
hasn't been as good as we would like. But I think there's a big difference between acquiring a product that's great and original and just trying to copy something. Because yeah. you're just trying to copy something that's already yeah. swept the nation. You're wasting money and you're wasting time because no one is going to use it. Well, and like right. Google Plus is great. I love it. But you know what? It's like it's just not going to catch on in the way that they would like, yeah. I think. Well, that's and right. same with Google Drive. But you know, services like Google Voice are great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, so Gmail was Gmail is like the shining example of when Google nailed it, which yep. was like email wasn't new. That's whatever. But like Google was like email kind of sucks. One and when Gmail came out, it was at a time where I had a twenty megabyte cap on my email. <laughs> yeah, and I was deleting constantly. Mm-hmm. It was I was always battling with like and Gmail was like, yo, you get a gig. Yeah, I paid for hosting because of that cap. Yeah. So so whatever. <laughs> I was, like, too young for this. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we'll have to sit around and see, we'll, we'll see what happens. Assuming the rumors are true, assuming it does come out uh, in early April, uh, we'll wait and see. And hopefully there's something compelling yeah. beyond just um, a Dropbox knockoff. Mm. Okay, so uh, another thing in the news. Now, actually, sort of a couple weeks ago at this point, but... Uh, a, a, Recently, uh, a potential employer asked their potential employee to uh, give them, hand over their Facebook credentials, their login, uh, username, and password, so that they could vet that potential employee by rifling through their stuff, which of course is absurd, and it's led to um, a lot of talk about, um, basically, well, for whether one, whether or not that is something that anyone should be able to do, which yeah. roundly everyone says no, and two... Mm. Uh, just like the the extent to which you want to sort of have that interplay of social with your employers beyond just the password thing, which yeah. know, everyone can agree is insane. It's ridiculous. But also, you know, like do you friend your hiring manager on mm-hmm. Facebook. Do you become friends with people at work? Yeah. Your boss, whatever. Um, I have. You've you've done which? I've friended I've, your employer. I think I'm. I, I think I was. <laughs> I mean, we're both I, friends I'm with preview. you. Well, yeah. Well, that's different. But the. Uh, but the way I, I, one of my previous jobs, I think I'm, I, I don't know if I was at the time because I didn't really use Facebook, but I was friends with my hiring manager and my boss. Well, and there's, there are things to say about going mm-hmm. either direction because obviously yeah, it wasn't making bad connections thing. with people can be a really good way to mm-hmm. get a job in the first place. Yep. Um, and Alan, I believe, Alan yes. Henry, uh, life hacker writer Alan Henry, uh, did a post uh, a, sort of talking about the issue. Um, but, but I think, you know, yeah, you guys do, his post was, what do I do when my employer wants to be too social? Mm. Um, How do you handle, you know, when you, when they friend request you, you know, before the interview or after the interview or once you've been hired and whether you should. Oh, no, no, fish yourself. No, that was, that was basically okay. whether you should go along with that. Well, it's, I think, I think it. <clears throat> I don't think there's really so much of a problem anymore because Facebook actually implemented those lists that no one really uses or pays attention Which to. Which you should be using. Yeah, them. exactly, because then you can just put, you can friend them and put them in a list where they see two things and yeah. it's, there's really no difference. And then you don't have to worry about like the social implications at work or whatever. And then they don't, you know, then they only see what you want them to see. But I think this, I, th- I think what's kind of worrisome and who knows how much this has actually happened, the problem of people asking for passwords right. um, but but the fact that it, it does come up makes me wonder how we're perceiving the way we act in public like, like they think that this is not a big deal because everyone's just putting everything out there anyway yeah I can tell you this if I uh, if my potential employee required me to give them my Facebook credentials they would be really bored <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, the least used Facebook account on the planet. Yeah, they could see true. all of the posts I make to the Life Hacker page. And yeah, nothing else. To my... A few Instagram pictures. Um, but anyway, <laughs> bit of advice: don't give anyone your Facebook yeah. password. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's about sums it up. <laughs> Ooh yeah. Uh, last, uh, and this is actually sort of my favorite bit of my news too. from last week. Uh, I have no idea about any of this. I'm going to learn something today. The Media Center, XBMC, has updated uh, to a brand new release, XBMC 11.0 Eden. Um, and it's added a lot of really cool features and just polished to XBMC. Uh, it's added some speed boosts, AirPlay support, so oh, yeah. any iOS device or even Android, whatever, anything that supports AirPlay, uh, yeah. streaming audio or video to AirPlay now works to stream audio or video to your XBMC box. Um, 
The XBMC Live CD is changed to XBMC Ubuntu. Uh, so, have you given XBMC Ubuntu a shot? Because I know you're a live. I'm upgraded. not a live user. I've upgraded to XBMC. Ubuntu. What's it like? Is it a little bit slower? Is the desktop it nice? It looks exactly. Ne- it's really the same. I'm never going to use the desktop. Um, so whatever. Uh, it looks. It, it, I mean, it's basically the same. Okay. As for I hear. I hear the purposes. installation was supposed to be like a little bit easier because you don't. Actually, you don't have, you don't have to do it all. More of the a pain. Really. Because it was, you know, I, I've got it plugged into that, and you still need, like, a keyboard or a mouse plugged in to do it. And it gives you, like, a GUI, a graphical, like, interface for hitting next and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, like, the resolution wasn't scaling correctly oh, on my yeah. thing, and, like, it actually worked better. It was easier <laughs> to install before, but That's funny. that may not be for all people, but in mm-hmm. my specific instance. But it wasn't a big enough difference to make it, like, a you know, no. cause an uproar in the um, cash house. It worked. Uh, I got it all upgraded. It works really well. Um, the AirPlay thing I'm pretty stoked about because I have uh, an Airport Express hooked up to my computer back there specifically for AirPlay. Um, mm-hmm. But it's it also means I have to, like, switch the input on my stereo when I want it. Now it's be, like, the same thing. It's basically Plus you can, you can do a video, which is nice. Yeah, and the video, which you, there were, like, sort of some... some backwater hacks that you could apply and scripts mm-hmm. that, that I had tried and that worked half the time. So, But it's really nice. It's, it's now integrated. Better. It works. It can't play DRM'd videos from iTunes, though, which is kind of a bummer. Which it, is like the one it, reason yeah. I would find that really useful, because if yeah. I had a video on my iOS device, I probably already have an XBMC. That is but a bummer. That's a bummer. Um, the speed boosts were really nice from someone who has a very low power uh, media center. Mm-hmm. Um, it just seemed a little bit snappier in like loading images, you know, big images and stuff like mm-hmm. it does. I also, they also, the add-on rollback thing is kind of cool. Just to have as a security thing, you can, if you really like XBMC add-ons, which I would highly recommend taking a look through their add-on repositories because there's some really cool stuff. Um, if an add-on updates and you don't like the update, you can roll back to the latest version with just you know one tap, which is very, very nice. Piece of cake. Uh, but anyway, XBMC, it's looking awesome. I'm still it's waiting great. for the Apple TV 3 to get yeah. jailbroken, so yeah. I can install XBMC on that and see if things can really fly at that point, because that would be... Awesome. I, would, I would replace the little Acer that I use as my main home theater right now. Uh, but anyway, cool. If you, you have a media center, absolutely worth checking out. If you don't have a media center, absolutely worth making one. <laughs> Whether it's an Apple it's TV or a home built box or something. With with a really good media center like XBMC, you can navigate and play so Hulu awesome. with your remote. Mm. Uh, you can navigate. There's this awesome plugin for XBMC called TV Shows that we're thinking about looking into more for a post at some point that aggregates every streaming possibility on the web. And you can basically go through... Um, what are you, free cable is what it's called. Is that what I said? Maybe. You can basically go through by channel oh, and cool. click on the channel yeah. and then go through the shows through that shows. they offer. It's really well done. I remember wow. trying it a while back and only half the stuff really worked, but supposedly it's TV working much better now. Anyway, uh, awesome. That's the Makes news. Sense. Let's kick over to some questions. So to kick us off, reader Adam writes in, I was wondering what your thoughts were on installing OS X on a Windows hard drive partition. Are the steps the same? How would one choose which OS they wanted to boot? Um, okay, I'm, I'm not sure I entirely understand this question. Do you so wait, he says installing OS X on a Windows partition? Windows hard drive partition. Okay, so okay, let's, let's, let's start by saying that there seems to be a little bit of a misconception out there with some people that you can just install OS X on any Windows machine, which is really not <laughs> yeah. true. Um, so for th- I'm going to assume that you are on a Hackintosh-capable machine. If you are not, I would not even attempt this because it's... To double check, in case you don't know, I would head to TonyMacX86.com, uh, yes. head to the forums, post your specs, and ask <coughs> someone to vet them for you. Yes. If it is Hackintosh-capable, or if you decide to build a Hackintosh-capable machine, in that case, you then have a PC on which you can install S10. Now, I, I've done this a few times. It, uh, it's very complicated in, in which order you install certain things because different OSs like to try and take over your hard drive in different ways. Um, the easiest way to have OS 10 and Windows dual booting on a PC, or on a non-Mac PC, I should say, is to install OS 10 first and Windows second. Does it matter if you had like two hard drives and Two hard drives is actually the easiest way to do it. So as opposed, so you could partition one drive and have them both on there, but that's 
kind of more of a pain in the butt than it's worth, in mm -hmm. my opinion. If you have a second hard drive, it's incredibly simple to install OS X on one hard drive. Okay. You install Windows on the second hard drive, steps are basically the same, and then you're done and you can dual boot. Um, we've done a guide on triple booting a Hackintosh with OS X, Windows, and Linux, and you can obviously just ignore the Linux steps and dual boot with OS X and Windows, so we'll put that in the show notes, and I would recommend checking that out. Yeah, and, cool. uh, and just to, uh, we, I've been meaning to say this, but in general, the show notes, anytime, lifehacker.com slash the show um, is going to be the quickest way to find the show notes for each episode. Yep. Um, so yeah. Cool. Okay, uh, now we've got a caller. Okay, cool. Um, so this is a this is a tough question to answer because a lot of it, yeah. it, it, it <coughs> there is a ton of media and and the internet is only accelerated the pace at which media is 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 created and distributed and so you have virtually limitless options to like absorb your intention and also everything's <coughs> trying to convince you like that this should be read. So yeah. apart from mm -hmm. apart from something that is like uh, a, a, an ephemeral like cat uh, singing in the <laughs> toilet like that just like the image in your head you're like oh I need to click that because I now want to see a cat s singing in the toilet is that a real thing? I, probably yeah, yeah. Uh, but but beyond that um, there, there are things like um, you know you want to improve yourself you see something that's like oh this seems really interesting I'm interested in learning about this whatever and you can end up bookmarking or instapapering like a billion things that you'll never get to mm. That said, I actually find personally that um, a lot, a lot, being able to offload in those ways is actually a really nice mm. way to, to sort of uh, keep things around that you maybe get, will get to, but but not think about it as as a, like an email inbox. Like my Instapaper yeah. account, uh, or read it later, or um, readability, readability, any of those services. I use it, and I, I use it as sort of like a bookmark for things I, I want to read that like I think will be rewarding to read later. Like I, I have a, I have a specific set of sort of criteria that is like this is the kind of thing. So for me, it's things that I want to read. I think will be like interesting or educational or just like a, a really well written article or whatever. Don't have time to do now, and then I'll just go nuts with that. Mm. I don't read a lot of the stuff that ends up in instant paper, but anytime I get around to. Um, mm -hmm. A time where I've got a free period and I can dedicate it to like reading, I'll open up Instapaper and I'll just like go through what I've bookmarked and I've got just a, you know a great list of things that I can cherry pick from those. Then so it's sort of like whittling down into yeah. what I've got time for. Yeah, and it's also really great when you can go through and search that stuff later because you may put something in there, forget about it. You really wanted to look at it, but then you can go, then you, you remember it three months down the line, and then it's at least there. I think it's really a lot about letting go and also filtering things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that is in itself kind of a filter because you can just throw stuff in there yeah. and let it and, and, and get rid of it. But also, I mean, there are ways in RSS readers to create smart lists of, of your feeds yeah. and just get certain articles. You can use apps like Flipboard to filter that out. You obviously can filter things in your email, especially with Gmail. But that's great. And then, I, but I think like people just need to realize that you're not going to get to everything, mm -hmm. and you do your best to try to here's here's the stuff that you want to focus on, yeah. um, and then focus on it and say if I get to the other stuff, great. If I don't, whatever. Um, I I actually like to I like the idea of creating sort of tiers of attention with it, where mm -hmm. like if I'm Sam and I'm in an RSS reader, so you know I've got the Life Hacker RSS feed. 
First of all, um, just very briefly, you can filter our feed uh, if you use like, uh, if you want to oh, yeah, buy tag, you could be lifehacker.com slash top, which is our top story slash index.xml. Uh, and you can do that with any of uh, our tags. Like Windows, if you're a Windows. Yeah. Oh, and you can like, get more specific, like you could go, you could do download slash Windows yes. to yeah. filter it that way too. Um, but, uh, but beyond that, uh, I, I do, I personally really like sort of starting at broad places and then whittling down through tiers. So for example, if I'm using my RSS reader, I'll be going through and maybe I will star a bunch of things and then I can then put the attention on the starred things and then sort of weed out which is really like worthwhile and which isn't, um, which I'm gonna send to Instapaper, which I'm just gonna forget about. Um, and it's also in the same way, I wrote something a week ago, I think, that was about about like communication and sort of how I like to, to use communication uh, based on sort of the immediacy. So it's mm -hmm. like, I am is for like right now, email is for like today or whatever. So, mm -hmm. that, so that you're not constantly checking your email, yeah. you're not a, a slave to your email. But I feel like there's a similar thing with, uh, with consumption of media where you can sort of like create uh, separation and sort of whittle things down. Mm -hmm. Twitter is one of those things that uh, is more like the I am for me of media consumption, where it's like uh, if something comes up in Twitter, I'm much more likely to read it like right, right now, now as opposed mm -hmm. to my RSS feed. Yep. Um, I know that this, I don't feel like we're necessarily 100% yeah. answering your question, but I will recommend that you check out um, our friend Clay Johnson uh, has a book out uh, that came out at the beginning of this year called The Information Diet, uh, and he has a website, informationdiet.com, and he, he's all about uh, the idea of sort of uh, a, conscien a conscious uh, consumption of media where you uh, cut down on all of the noise, uh, increase the signal, and go to the source, and basically just like ideas for how to um, sort of best consume media in a world where me information overload is, is the norm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I would recommend very much checking that out as well. So our next question uh, from Anonymous uh, says, I am a student in high school and it's hard for me to take notes and listen to my teacher at the same time. Is there any app for my MacBook uh, where I could record my teacher's lectures and fill in the gaps on my notes. Yes, it's called Notebook. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's made by a company called Circus Ponies. Um, and it's, uh, it's a really great thing, I think, for students. And, you know, if you take a lot of notes in meetings, it's good too. But you can record the audio and type while you, while you go. Windows people can also get Microsoft OneNote, which has that feature as well. And that's that's interesting. I've never, so with, with Notebook, does it, um, does it then tie your notes to the audio? Yeah, at times sort I mean, of like the way you, well, you can, has comments. Yeah, you can put little audio clips with it. I don't like it. Won't it, it's not like a live scribe pen where you write on the notes and then you can play it back as it and it shows your writing as you go. Mm -hmm. But you can tie little audio clips to it. All right. So our next question comes from a caller. Hello. So Whitson is our resident uh, yeah. number porter slash VoIP, VoIP user. user. Um, so I would say one thing to start off. Um, you say you want to get rid of your cell phone service because you don't use it. That's fine. But um, no VoIP solution is going to give you the ability to make emergency calls. So if you don't have a cell phone, I highly uh, suggest that you get a home phone service. I'm sure you can find it in an inexpensive one because if you are only using VoIP, you can't call 911. <laughs> can I interject? 
Uh, I do know though if you don't have if you don't have a cell phone plan, mm -hmm. but you have a cell phone with like a SIM card in it or something. That's true. They can make emergency they can calls. Make emergency calls. So Very I would say, point. I totally forgot about. Go that. ahead yeah. and cancel, but keep your phone. I forgot about that, card. even though I wrote an article about it last week. Yeah, or just don't rob anyway. or <laughs> get robbed or get into a situation where you're going to get murdered or something. set yourself on fire. Yeah, danger, That's, man. Um, yeah. Anyway, but getting to the the, the point. Yes, there are a lot of great ways to do that. Um, I personally have ported my num my old cell phone number to Google Voice, and it wasn't a perfectly seamless process just because when you do that, your carrier is going to want to hit you with an early termination fee unless your contract is up. Um, so if your contract's up, it's going to be a very seamless process. You just uh, go to Google Voice, sign up for an account, uh, go to the port your number option. It'll cost you 20 bucks. Your old number will be your Google Voice number, and you can forward it to whatever phones you want including Skype, which I do in my apartment. Um, they're very easy to make, play nicely with each other. You just need to pay for an online number and maybe get a little bit of Skype credit, probably like 30 bucks a year. You can you can get unlimited in the US and Canada for, I think, yeah, for, for that. Oh, so I, so sorry, the way that Google Voice works is I have it set up with Skype. So I, my Skype only, like, can't make outgoing calls, it can only get incoming calls, oh. which is fine because I just dial my numbers from the Google Voice web interface and then it calls Skype, so it counts as an incoming call, mm -hmm. which oh, is much clever. which is much cheaper than making out when also mm -hmm. signing up for outgoing calls. I don't um, think you have to do both anymore, I think they changed it. Okay, either way, I'm not sure though. I can... only pay for an incoming number with Skype, web number, it's cheap, mm -hmm. um, literally like 30 bucks a year, 60 bucks a year, it's way cheaper than getting a home phone or, yeah. cell, or cell phone service, and it works pretty darn well with Google Voice. So that's what I use, that's what I would recommend. Um, I don't know what other services you could port, I don't know if you could port your number to Skype, but I highly recommend Google Voice because then you can literally just forward those calls to anything you want. So if you do get a home phone or cell phone again down the line, you don't need to go through that process again, you can just forward those calls to whatever phones you want. And yeah, if you port that number to Google Voice, it's yeah, it's it's aces for life. It, it, it yeah, yeah. Or as long as Google Voice is around, which like, is good because it's not easy to get it out of Google Voice. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. so but yeah, I, I I I now officially my Google Voice number will be my number for life. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I could yeah, I couldn't convince I'm certain trying. people like my mom had memorized my old number for years and like refused to memorize new ones. So I just ported it. I said screw it. It was easy enough. Twenty bucks. I'm making everyone use both because no one wants. Some people want one, some people want the other. I'm like, okay, you have to let everyone else learn both because you all suck. <laughs> all right, reader Alfian writes: How do you get a personalized email address? For example, Adam at lifehacker.com. Um, well, you can't have a lifehacker.com because that's ours. <laughs> you can beg, unless you want to get a job here. Um, <laughs> it's actually, it, it's probably the e as easy as it's ever been. It, it's, yeah. it's really simple. I, I actually think there are many ways you can go about doing this. Um, the easiest way, and I'm assuming when you say personalized email, you probably also want that personalized email to use Gmail. Yeah, because um, why wouldn't you? In which case, uh, for, I think the easiest that I've ever done probably, and, and this is probably available with many other services, but using DreamHost. Yeah, they set is, that up for you. Uh, which is a, a web hosting company that is... Pretty great, uh, especially for just like really simple needs for web uh, related things. Um, you can sign, sign up for DreamHost, you can buy a domain if you don't already have one. Mm. And when you have that domain at, at DreamHost, it's literally like a one click operation mm. to say like host my email uh, with Google Mail or mm -hmm. Gmail. And, and voila, you've got your email. Um, it's super simple to set up, and then and then basically you're just using Gmail. So there will be there will be sort of an admin interface where you can invite new users to it, which um, I, is something like at Google.com/slash/account/slash/settings, or I don't really know. It's one of <laughs> when you're logged into that account, though, you can so but you you add new users that way, and you invite new users and whatever. So like we have of course a, a life hacker one where. It's just Gmail. Yeah. yeah, and it's just Gmail. It's awesome. Um, but it's super easy. There are other ways, but honestly, that's just, it's a really easy way. I think actually even Google probably, I, I remember I think a couple years ago Google added it where you could buy a domain through them and go yeah, that way. Probably. Yeah, probably. I don't see why not. But if you're, looking to, if you're looking to buy a domain anyway, you may as well get a little hosting with it too. Yeah. And I would 
Dream hosts is or or a comparable service is a really good way to do that. Yeah. Plus, get the email. And if you don't want to use Dream hosts, you can still. I'm sorry, if you don't want to use Dream hosts uh, email app or, or Gmail. If you, I mean, they have Dream hosts has Squirrel right. Mail built in, mm-hmm. and you can also just edit your MX record, which is something you'd learn about when you uh, sign up for one of these things, and then um, and then go with anything else. Um, I, I, I think like even if you want more privacy, I think like Hush Mail is an option too. Mm-hmm. And uh, and yeah, so that I mean, I think I think there are a lot of other ways to go, but Gmail is definitely the best way to go, and that's the quickest way. But if you just wanted to pay for the domain name, which was you know seven to twelve dollars a year, yeah, Google. I mean, and you could do it directly through Google. Google doesn't charge anything for Google apps if you put your if you put ads in it. So that could it could be a really really cheap way to get a custom email address, and you can do all sorts of other things like they have sites and uh-huh. and all those whatever, whatever else it does, docs and the calendar. All those things. <laughs> yeah. All that good stuff. All right, cool. Um, so that's it for questions for today. Let's kick over to downloads. All right, downloads. Yes. Okay, the first download uh, for today is RT7 Lite, spelled like an app that doesn't want anyone to be able to find <laughs> yeah. it. And it's spelled differently all over like the website and program, too. It's, it's, no, it's absurd. RT S E. Seven E N L I T E. Um, this is a download we talked about in depth on the site a couple weeks ago. Um, it is essentially a program that lets you take a Windows installation disk and craft it into the OS of your dreams. You can remove Windows features you don't want. You can add. You can you know um, slipstream in updates. You could add like Service Pack One to your installation disk. Oh, you don't have cool. to go through Windows Update and install that every time you install. You can even um, add in your favorite applications. So they all, whenever you install Windows, it automatically adds in things like Firefox and Pigeon and Winamp or whatever else you want. It's super awesome. Uh, I, if you are a Windows user and you plan on installing, uh, doing a clean install anytime soon, absolutely recommend checking it out. There's tons of stuff you can do with it. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to take us too far on a tangent, but I love Whitson's. Um Witson's apps are all so old school. <laughs> Firefox, Pigeon, Winamp, <laughs> all your favorite cool new apps. Windows doesn't Get have a lot today. of really new things going on. Um, those are all wonderful apps. I know, it's just, yeah. I'm um, okay, uh, OS X, uh, the download for today is called Porthole. <coughs> and Porthole is uh, a menu bar application that lets you stream audio from your Mac to any AirPlay destination. Um, it's similar to uh, an application called Airfoil. Airfoil. Uh, Airfoil has been around for a really long time. Long time. Airfoil is more expensive. Um, and it can do a lot though. It can do a lot. It has a lot of advanced features if you want to check it out, but. It's not, Airfoil's awesome. This is just cheaper and it's really simple. And I think for most people, it, it might be, it's $10 and it might be more sort of what most people need anyway. Yeah. It's got a little menu bar app when you want to send it to another Airplay destination in the house, it's, like your stereo or your new XBMC 11.0 Eden installation. <laughs> uh, you just click the menu bar, select the name of that destination and mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's rolling. Perfect for streaming things like Spotify or other app, you know, Groove yeah. Shark, things that don't support AirPlay, right. which like iTunes. Um, and, and I, I was actually confused about this, and maybe you remember, uh, or maybe even asked you about this time, but in Mountain Lion, AirPlay mirroring is supported, which yeah. is basically will take your entire monitor and put it on your Apple TV, whatever, or, what, yeah. or whatever AirPlay. Whatever does can, it. yeah, can whatever can receive it. that. Um, but does that also mean that just like AirPlay audio streaming will be a system-wide preference? I, do, I don't oh, think so. Be. The way the way that yeah, it really should. But it, the way it looks, it's like you just you're mirroring a display. It doesn't look like it just sends the audio. And that's yeah, it, that's that seems what I was to be. About. I'm not, I I kind of don't want to say this, but because uh, I don't know. But AirParrot, which is the app that lets you do that in uh, OS wow. Online, I think you can do it in Snow Leopard. But uh, that, I mean, which is also ten dollars, um, that uh, I, I think that has the same functionality in that it doesn't send the audio; it just sends yeah. the video. But it, but it, it has the advantage of being able to extend your desktop. Right. Um, I, I would also so, mention very, very briefly that if you are a huge cheapskate like me, <laughs> go to the command line. There's a program called Route X R A O P X yeah. that you can run on the command line that will stream audio to Nerper Express. 
Um, it's there's like a nine second delay. It's kind of yeah, it's it's a considerably longer delay. And it is from the from but like it's Command worth line. it. It's, but that's, it's totally free. You it's guys, one do, one dollar you save for every second of delay. Okay. Some quick math. But, uh, moving uh, on to <laughs> our mobile devices. Paper Mill is a Android app. A Paper Mill is an Android instant paper client. And we're just talking about Instant Paper. There are uh, quite a few Instant Paper clients for Android already that are kind of just... The, the Instant Paper developer is very um, Mac and iOS centric. Mark and, on, man. Yes. Um, and he, he said that he doesn't want to go through the trouble of creating an Android client, but he has an API for anyone to do it. And he said if, there, if one came out that was really good and really kind of exemplified everything that... For Android. Yeah, yeah for Android. That exemplified everything that... Um, he, he meant to do with the iOS clients that he would make that the quote official Android app and I believe that's what he's done with this one um, so if you are looking for Instagram on Android this is a really good one to look for it uh, it's it's a little bit young it might not be as feature filled as some of the other ones but it looks great it's a good bet it's solid um, yeah cool but if you're an Android user there's also always read it later and readability which is what I'm currently hooked on and, 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 um, and those which, are is also, have, which is have official support for Android and those are also on iOS and they're both also great yep um, okay lastly for iOS we have camera grabber huh, this is an easy one this is uh, and, and a lot of people don't don't get this because if you if you have iOS 5.1 you have that little shortcut on your iPhone on your imaginary iPhone um, where you where you tap the camera button on your lock screen and the camera comes up and then you have your activator short jailbreak shortcut which opens up the camera after three taps of the home button. Mm -hmm. Another way to do it if you're jailbroken and you're still on iOS 5.0.1 and you can't upgrade to 5.1 or you'll, you'll lose the jailbreak but you still want the camera shortcut that's always persistent. Camera grabber is really cool because on the lock screen you don't tap anything or whatever you just what well, you do you tap and then just slide the lock screen away and it's kind of and part of it, part of it's like you could still use this in 5.1 if the jailbreak was yeah. available because it's kind of cool. <laughs> but uh, functionality-wise, it will bring that persistent camera. Uh, it brings so the one great thing about iOS 5.1. Yes, so those the of only jailbroken and still on 5.0.1. The only thing outside of Japan that iOS 5.1 did. Yeah. So it's basically and it's, it's cool. basically reverse mm -hmm. notification drawer. You swipe yes. up instead That's of a good swiping way to put it. down. Yep. Um, cool. Baller. That's oh, that's it. All right. Well, that is it for this week. Um, we will see you next time. If you'd like to ask us a question, send us an email at tips plus ask lh show at lifehacker .com. Alternatively, leave us a message at three four seven six eight seven eight one zero nine. Try to keep your questions to about thirty seconds so we can keep the show moving. And thanks for watching, listening, or however you're getting this podcast from the internet to your brain. Oh, we were supposed to clap. I forgot. We were supposed to clap for the clips. Hey, now you have one. I always forget because we're used to. In the first clip, sync to Buddy's bark.